Uh, then we introduced the stage and substage graph to define the computational flow for GPU. So uh, computational graph is converted to, to this one. And actually this is designed for Balkan, so uh, the sta stage is direct correspond to render passing Balkan, and substage correspond to surpassing Balkan. Surpass is actually set according Balkan. So, so that once we got this graph, so this this is directly mapped to, uh, how should I say, mapped to Balkan object, so we can immediately execute on GPU. Uh, and finally, our system has a reactive cache. So reactive cache is, uh, so after several executions, uh, our system automatically find the uh, uh, constant values on the graph, uh, and uh, it, they are automatically cached. So it includes the uh, generate a stage and substage pack again. So in our pipeline, the stage and substage packing is a novel part. So uh, I will explain this part in detail. So let's see that this is a, a single substitute packing process. So the input is a computational graph. Uh, we tried to this one to make some substages. So it starts from the bottom of the computational graph and, and share the code uh, growing up. So we are checking some condition for DPUs. So of course the uh, mobile GP, uh, not less powerful GPU such as mobile has a strict condition to make shared codes and uh, powerful GPU such as desktops has loose condition to make uh, this substage. So finally it reaches some uh, conflict, some conditions. So we stopped processing and finally uh, we uh, generate GLS shared code from this computation. So substage packing is applied recursively from the bottom in a greedy manner. Uh, uh, so the, okay, let's let's resume. So substage packing is uh, uh, continues. So it can it it packs the entire full computation graph. So so now completed the computation graph is split it into six parts of substage pack, uh, substage. So similarly, we perform stage packing. So this is a kind of the render pass generation for Balkan. So it starts from bottom, similarly, and finally, it packs all computations. So those are directly mapped to Balkan objects, so we can immediately execute on GPU. So, okay, uh, let me explain the reactive cache in our system next. So. Suppose that with this is a, some graph, and we uh, dress ex after execution several times, the, our dress ad up, up check updates automatically on the graph. So some nodes are updated, but there are some constant nodes. Uh, we draw the updated node in dark gray, and not updated in light gray. Notice that the, this from B3 to B4, not, up, not updated, so constant, it can be cacheable. So we cache this part. Then uh, we can get simplified without removing this part. So it allows much faster computation. So uh, let, let me introduce the example of reactive cache. So this is a before cache. Uh, you can see actually this is a kind of computation where it is very complicated. Uh, this is taken from the diffuse elevator texture optimization with PBL. The number of functions uh, is more than 1,000. 
But after cache, so actually this, this graph has many cacheable parts such as iradian sampling and rasterization. So after cache, the number of functions are drastically reduced to 47, so uh, iteration is much faster. Okay, so next, uh, uh, I will explain the DR algorithm uh, on the top of our address CAD, hardware accelerated soft rasterizer, hard soft rust. Uh, uh, this is the overview of hard soft rust. The, the first step of hard soft rust is the hardware rasterization with depth speeding. So we propose new techniques called enlarge and shift for uh, hardware rasterization. Uh, this step generates G buffers. Actually, this is multiple G buffers. And the uh, shading uh, power buffer is applied to generate shaded buffers. Uh, at the same time, the rasterization process generates screen space distance. I, I will explain this later. And also edge mask. Finally, uh, we use the edge aware branding to make final render the image. So rasterization and branding is a uh, this is the pipeline of our method. Uh, okay, so the, uh, uh, we compare the rasterization based to the algorithms. The, the first of all, that Pyto 3D uh, used the uh, software rasterizer, so its speed is not fast, uh, time consuming. But they use a uh, far range gradient, so it is robust for optimization. But uh, they blur all pixels, so accuracy is limited. Uh, in contrast, the uh, NVD Frost uh, introduced uh, uh, hardware rasterization for uh, DR, so it is very fast. Uh, but uh, because they are near range derivatives, so robustness is limited. And uh, the accuracy is good because the, they apply anti aliasing for some edge pixels. So our hard soft rust uh, actually cherry picks exit methods. So we use hard, hardware rasterizer and hard far range gradient and gradient or edge pixels. So our method is fast, robust, and accurate. Uh, okay, so uh, next I will introduce the enlarge process uh, hardware rasterization with screen space distance. Hard soft, uh, soft rust or Python 3D, etc., use pixel wide CUDA computation to generate screen space distance. So screen space distance is a pixel to triangle edge distance. Actually, this is very important for rasterization BL uh, to, to propagate uh, screen space losses to 3D vertex attributes. So all of existing methods implement something right here. So from all pixels, uh, check all triangle faces and calculating distance and et cetera. So the outermost loop is pick four pixels, so this computation is not efficient on hardware rasterizer. On the other hand, our enlarge process is uh, we, we process the uh, computation in a face-wise manner by geometrically enlarged triangles. So our uh, pseudocode is something like that. The outermost loop is uh, triangle faces, and then for each face, we enlarge triangles geometrically and rasterize by hardware. And, uh, for each pixel on the enlarged triangles, uh, we can calculate distance or et cetera. So this, uh, this, this algorithm is efficient with hardware rasterizer. Next, we introduce shift process, uh, this modification to prioritize the uh, important region. So I introduced the face uh, enlargement process. Actually, the Python 3D uh, uses method enlarge face uh, in a pixelized computation but they don't prioritize uh, for original face region and uh, uh, enlarged region. So, uh, so maybe yes, sometimes the enlarged region occlude uh, original face region uh, with faster depth values. We call this is a uh, pseudo occlusions. So on the other hand, we propose shift to uh, uh, prioritize the important region. First of all, the original faces in the dark color should be more important than enlarged region. So, we modify depth value uh, always the original face is in the front of energy region and and in the among the energy region uh, closer to original faces should be more important so put more uh, higher priority to them so finally uh, i will introduce the hr branding process so after rasterization and shading 
So input is uh, screen space shaded distilled buffers and shaded buffers. Then first we brand all pixels based on uh, similar to software. So we can get the blurry, uh, far range gradient images. On the other hand, we keep sharp textured image. And the additional input is H mask. And finally, I applied the weighted sum uh, with blurry image and sharp image and H mask. So finally, we get uh, blurry on edges, but sharp texture inside. So this image enables uh, robust and accurate optimization. Okay, so next we validate our system. So I, uh, we used uh, a small inverse rendering problem. The input is white sphere geometry and the target is six green pier images to make optimize green, uh, this sphere to make similar to green pier. So this is the result, uh, some of the visual results. So you can see uh, white sphere is deformed to green pier uh, on desktop and laptop and mobile. So it works. Uh, identically on several devices. And we also numerically analyzed uh, this optimization process. Uh, we put uh, left wines uh, loss curves for uh, geometry optimization and uh, right wines uh, uh, loss curves for texture optimization. We tested on NVIDIA, AMD, Intel, and AM. So you can, you can find that all loss curves are almost similar. So, all overlapped, almost perfectly. So, we can say the same row curves are, uh, uh, we can, uh, this, this indicate that our method is hardware agnostic. So, next we uh, validated our stage packing technique. So the, on the left, this is a naive shader splitting. So it's just a splitting all the computations one by one. So at this moment, uh, uh, it takes uh, nearly two seconds per iteration. But uh, with our substage packing technique, it is almost same to kernel fusion technique. So the iteration speed is less than 400 milliseconds. And finally, we had substage packing, stage packing, and reactive cache. So iteration uh, time is much fewer than, uh, it's almost 58 milliseconds per iteration, so it becomes much faster. So we confirm our stage packing and reactive, pass con reactive cache contribute to faster speed. Uh, then we perform experiment to compare our method with existing methods. First uh, experiment is a performance comparison. Uh, we compare the forward and uh, backward time spent by iteration. Uh, we compare the NVD first and apply to 3D. So the first setting is the non-textured mesh. Non-textured mesh, uh, we change the window resolution from 256 to 2K. So our method is at least faster than uh, 1.6 uh, times faster than used methods. The other setting is texture mesh. So in, in this case, we fixed the window resolution 2K and we increased texture resolution from 1K to 4K. So in the texture mesh setting, so our method is at least two times faster than this method. So yeah, finally we confirm, confirm that our method is faster than this method in, on, with visual, with our textures. Okay. Uh, and next, next is a 3D reconstruction uh, experiment. Uh, it's similar to previous peer uh, one, but the input source is a white sphere geometry. And target is 49 to 64 real images taken from DTU dataset. So yeah, this is actual uh, images captured by actual camera. And we try to fit this white sphere to uh, images and get the optimized geometry and texture. Okay, so this is the optimization process uh, with decaying Laplacian regularization factor. So our method is right. Uh, our method is, uh, looks more stable than NVD plus in the middle. 
and these are results for other objects. So we can see same tendency. Uh, yes, so our method is artifact free and more stable. Okay, so we numerically analyzed experiment results. So this is the box plot for uh, 3D ROS. Uh, and we first shows rather variance and rather median, uh, like this. But uh, our method shows a much smaller variance and smaller median. So our method is robust and accurate. So uh, next, we show applications of our uh, system. Uh, this is a forward rendering result with for digital humans. So, yeah, we can render this kind of photorealistic uh, images. And actually, the photorealist, even with photorealist shaders, our shaders are fully differentiable and we can op perform optimize. Uh, this is an example of hair color optimization. Okay, in summary, the, our method supports complex shaders. Uh, as an example of digital human the, in the forward rendering, we can perform render, real time rendering with skin, hair, eyeball. At his shadow, etc. And also, our method uh, is differentiable rendering, so support for backward optimization. We show the uh, hair material optimization. Our method uh, DRESSI supports many applications, for example, such as the environment map and material optimization, normal, normal map optimization, and 3D move of model fitting. Conclusion and the future work. So we propose rasterization based DR system called DRESI. So uh, our, uh, there are three contributions. The first contribution is through AD system design. And we made the DRESI AD to realize this system design. So DRESI AD supports all uh, uh, rendering primitives with backward. And on the top of it, we propose hard software algorithm to uh, uh, other sort of sort of algorithm. So our method is uh, hardware agnostic, high performance, and uh, realize robust and accurate optimization, and also supports complex shaders. As future work, uh, we have two, two topics. The one is the beta gradient propagation and neural network integration to our system. Thank you for listening. So we hope we learn the near future. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for one question, if it's quick or two. You were first. There's a microphone that will be passed on. Hi. <coughs> Your work is really, it's, it's really hard, good work. I just have a question. Uh, you have kind of rasterization based um, differential rendering, and yes, it's amazing. But um, what do you think about employing global illumination on and all this stuff into your render? What's possible direction for it? And how can we reconstruct uh, all surfaces using your uh, engine in the future, taking into account multiple bounces, ambient occlusion, and all this stuff? Okay, thank you for the question. So maybe you're asking, so uh, how should I say? So yeah, of course our method is raster image based, so it's hard to implement the global animation in our system. So uh, yeah, our method is somewhat limited, but uh, how should I say? We are focusing on some real time uh, reconstruction and rendering. So yes, uh, how should I say? Yeah, uh, yeah, we, we can support somehow more faster with moderated quality applications. Uh, mm, sorry, uh, do you think that maybe some kind of optimized radiance volumes for global illumination can help in this case, or something like this? Uh, so actually we haven't uh, tried yet, but uh, we somehow, yeah, uh, we can try it, but but sorry, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure at this time. I think it will just work, no? I mean, you, you pluck your favorite real-time global illumination method based on rasterization and then off you go. 
But it should be differentiable. Yeah, well, but that will do that, I hope. I, I haven't tried, but I think there's good prospect that will be the case. Very quick second question. There has been one, please. Hello. Do you ever thought about um, implementing the automatic differentiation in the in the compiler itself? Compiler itself is uh, so you mean uh, so recently some techniques are proposed called Doctor Zit. Uh, so it is just a co comparing. Uh, it, it's a kind of compiler to support uh, the from the notation in the general language for in the back end is. Um, how should I say the LLVM or something? Many, uh, many backend support. So yeah, I think the uh, yeah compiler-based method is a uh, kind of a direction. Uh, but I think the so Balkan API is a very how should I say so very universal API. So uh, just uh, uh, yeah, our method can be uh, compatible with such uh, compiler-based methods. Yeah, because of that, the GLSL compiler is open source, so could easily get the code and modify it, for instance, if it, it's possible. Yeah, possibly, yeah. Mm. Not sure about this mic so far. Um, okay, let's thank the speaker again. Sorry for the little hiccups in the presentation. Well done. Mrs. Young, just bring this person that you thought that was the second speaker, which in fact is the third one. But hello, hello, hello. I'm Tobias. I'm your session chair. Hello. We're out there. Hello. I can hear you, but I can't see you. But we're working on that. Okay. So should should, should I present now? Oh, uh, hold it a second. I'm not sure <laughs> if they're yet. Yeah, I thought I was the third. <laughs> We can see you now. Hello. 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 Do you see us or at least me? No, I cannot see you from the Zoom link. Oh, I, can see you from, I can see you from the YouTube link. Okay, good, good. Um, I'll do introduction nonetheless. Um, this, is a pro, this is a talk on shader program traces and analyzing that. It's, it's learning again as the session is, is about. Um, you said you want to introduce yourself, so then I will step away and you do introductions and you have 20 minutes. Thank you. Okay. So, hello everyone. So I'm uh, Yuting Yang from uh, Princeton University. Um, actually, should I share my screen now? Can you see yes, my screen? Yeah. That's great. We all see it. Go ahead. Okay, great. Go for presenter, non-presenter mode. Yeah, that's perfect. Go ahead. Great. So, hello, everyone. My name is Hu Ting Yang, and I'm a grad student at Princeton University from US. And I'm going to present a paper, Learning from Shader Program Traces. This is collaboration with Connie Barnes from Adobe Research and my advisor, Adam Finkelstein from Princeton. Okay. So, Shaders are compact programs used to flexibly construct visual appearances and are essential for games, VR, visualization, and other interactive applications. Our paper focuses on procedurally generated fragment shaders, like the ones shown here, which generate color independently per pixel. All of the shaders we use in our experiments are adapted from shaderpoly.com. There are also many other great examples in, on that website. So graphics and vision researchers have investigated a variety of learning tasks for input-output image paths, such as image translation, enhancement, and then painting. For cases where the input image is generated from shaded programs, researchers have explored a variety of features that can augment simple RGB. For example, when learning shading or Monte Carlo denoising, features from the shading buffers include normals, albedo, and so forth. Such hand-picked features improve the performance of the learned model. 
In other domains like fluid simulation, additional information such as fluid velocity and vorticity have proven helpful for learning super resolution fluid flow. Likewise, nerve based learning methods find that positional encodings are helpful as an extra input to the network. However, these auxiliary features are also manually picked, and they vary between domains and applications. The main point of this paper is that when learning from a shaded program, rather than picking such features by hand, we can allow the learned model to examine the entire trace of the program. Program trace is the sequence of intermediate values computed during execution. Here is an example for this simple shaded program sign of x plus y. Its program trace includes each of its intermediate values shown on the right, which are x, y, the sum, and the output of the sign function. Because the shader programs generate 2D images, we can also think of its trace as a series of 2D feature maps or 3D cancer. This is a much more complicated program called TribiHeart. Its program trace contains features progressively generates the psychedelic appearance, as well as a mask in the shape of the heart. Here, we are only showing five examples of trace entries, but there are actually hundreds of them. Returning to the learning problem, typical network architectures take a three-channel input tensor encoding RGB. The point of our paper is that the model can learn instead from an n-channel input tensor that includes not just RGB and not just a few hand-picked features, but rather the full program trace. We propose several applications that could benefit from this method. The first is learning to reconstruct a denoise image like the one on the right from the noisy input image shown on the left which can be computed more quickly because it uses only one sample per pixel. Our second example is reconstructing the original denoise shader rendering shown on the right from the output of a simplified program shown on the left. The simplified program runs much more quickly, but notice on the left, all the high frequency textures are missing. Our third application post-processing can be thought of as an add-on to the previous two applications. We apply a post-processing filter to the rendering. For example, here we learn both denoising and the local depression filter at the same time. Our last application is a simulation of frogs of boys, which emulates the bird's frogging behavior. Our model learns from the trace that runs the simulation for one step and predicts future states as if the simulation were executed for many steps. Program traces has been used in machine learning applications such as malware detection or program synthesis. Similarly, partial rendering has also proven useful in inferring parameters for procedural models. Unlike application-specific designs, this paper focuses on a generic method that learns from shader program traces, which enjoys certain unique properties such as an emphasis on pixel output and an enormous degree of parallelism. We now start to describe details of our proposed framework that learns from program traces. Our compiler takes as input an arbitrary, uh, an arbitrary procedural shader program written in a domain-specific language embedded in Python and outputs to a TensorFlow backend that produces not only a rendered image, but also the full program trace, which is a vector of values per pixel. On the left is an example that generates this striking pattern in our DSL. On, on the right is the compiler-generated TensorFlow program that also collects the intermediate values in the program trace. Because each trace has a spatial size that's the same as the output, the computation is embarrassingly parallel and needs minimal modification for downstream deep learning models. However, 
The proposed method is not as straightforward as directly feeding concatenated program trace into arbitrary network. There are two challenges that I'd like to discuss today. Firstly, program traces can be arbitrarily long, which introduces learning difficulty both in terms of memory footprint and in runtime. The first technique we handle it is trace optimization. Instead of naively logging every program trace entry, our compiler already performs some optimization to get rid of highly correlated traces such as ones differ by a constant factor. The compiler also identifies common built-in functions and logs only function outputs. Built-in functions are usually ones we wish to treat as a black box, such as sign. Finally, the compiler also identifies iterative improvement loops and logs only the trace from the last iteration. This is because they repeatedly improve the approximation result to obtain a more accurate result, such as pre marching loop. And only the last situation is the most informative. The approaches I described so far help, but only to a limited extent. Therefore, we introduce a more general feature subsampling strategy. The most straightforward way is to log every case intermediate variable. Here, we are showing the entire program's computation as small cells, where only blue cells are locked. Also, because loops really create a large number of program trace entries, we explore the variety of subsampling rules specific to loop iterations, such as loop subsampling that locks every case iteration, or logging last and first k loops, or other strategies such as collecting mean and variance across loop iterations or clustering program trace entries based on their correlations. Empirically, we find that the general uniform subsampling always works good enough. This actually coincides with the no free launch theorem, which suggests that without prior knowledge, there is no single choice that could outperform all others on every aspect of the evaluation. Additionally, because generating a high quality ground truth denoise result at a thousand samples per pixel can be expensive, our learning task is limited to a relatively small data set. For efficient learning, we note that each ground truth denoise result is paired with a one sample per pixel noisy input during the training process. So during training, we can efficiently re-render the noisy one sample per pixel input by drawing different samples within the same pixel, which still corresponds to the same output. Therefore, although our output ground truth data is limited, we actually have infinitely many input-output pairs. For example, here, the noisy shader rendering could have multiple different copies with slightly different random offset on each pixel, but they all share the same ground truth image. Our method is actually orthogonal to the design of network architecture or loss metric. This is just an example network we used. We also experimented with a number of other designs and they are described in our paper. To evaluate our performance, we introduced several baselines. The most naive baseline is RGB, which simply uses an input image. The RGBX baseline is motivated by the handpicked auxiliary features used use, uh, in denoising Monte Carlo sequences. We find the RGBX baseline always outperforms RGB, so we report only the RGBX whenever possible. We additionally include the super sampling baseline for denoising application only. Samples are chosen to have comparable runtime with the neural network inference time. This is the visualization for our quantitative comparison. The bar shows relative LPIP's perceptual error compared to the RGBX baseline, which is indicated as the blue line above all bars. It is quite straightforward to see that all of our experiments have smaller error than the baseline. Now we show qualitative results on different applications, starting with the noisy. 
This is the oceanic shader we shown before. Well, we trained a denoising model to predict rendering generated at 1,000 samples per pixel. We first run the shader at one sample grid per pixel and then denoise the result. We can compare on a steel frame by zooming to the highlighted region. Note that ours better recovers the wave detail in the foreground. Here we show a Mandelbrot shader. This is the ground truth estimated at 1,000 samples per pixel. The RGBX baseline removes most of the noise, but some of the thin structure is broken, such as the region in the highlighted circle. Here is our result that nicely reconstructs the thin structure. We can take a closer look to the zoomed in region. Ours reconstructs the thin structures nicely, while RGBX demonstrates artifacts. We now present results for simplified reconstruction. Here we show the ground truth image for a balanced shader with high number of remarching iterations that nicely builds the scene. A simplified shader uses less number of iterations than the original one. Therefore, the street lights and the sidewalk far away have significant artifacts. Our method learns to extrapolate the more complex shader rendering from the program trace of the simplified shader. Note we have recovered the distant views. Let's take a closer look. Ours better reconstructs the distant buildings while RGBX has a transparent artifact. This is another example of bricks. The ground truth is the denoise rendering of a more complicated shader, while each tile has a random color variation generated by simplex noise. The simplified shader lacks the detailed color variation on each brick tile. Our method recovers the color variation naturally. Let's take a look at the zoom in region. The simplified shader lacks the color variation on the bricks tile. The RGBX baseline tries to generate the pattern, but is inconsistent with the ground truth. Ours, on the other hand, faithfully follows the ground truth. We will skip the post-processing application as they share similar properties as the denoising and simplified application. And we now demonstrate an example on simulation for flux of voids. This is the reference. The position and velocity between each frame are updated by 20 simulation passes. Because of the fine scale simulation steps, the voids accurately emulate the flocking behavior of birds. This is a naive baseline where the state between frames is updated by only one simulation pass with a large step. We can clearly see that because this baseline takes a large step without any correction to the boy's positions, the boy's behavior doesn't make sense at all. This input output baseline is an analogy to RGBX. We take one simulation step as input to the learner and learns to extrapolate to the larger step. We can see that the learner extracts some behavior, such as not to hit walls and to avoid neighbors to some extent, but the alignment is still quite poor. Our method correctly reconstructs all the flocking behavior and even learns the bumpy repulsion when the boy is trying to avoid all of his neighbors, as well as the wall. We analyzed which traces are more important using an existing metric from Marshall 2019. We find important traces correspond to human intuition. For example, for bricks shader, 
important features include distance to the nearest bird catch and the boolean that indicates whether the pixel is inside the mortar. This can help prevent the edge from being broken. We also analyze which subset of the program trees best benefits the learning task under a fixed budget to the number of input program trees. By default, we use uniform subsampling, which always works well. Another strategy is to enumerate all possible trace combinations and train a separate model for each of them. However, this introduces a combinatoric number of learning tasks and is intractable. Therefore, we propose two subsample strategies based on the important score. Both rely on training an additional model on every program trace. We can use the trained model to choose a subset of the trace with highest important score, which we call Oracle subsampling. Similarly, we can also deliberately choose the traces with lowest important score, which we call opponent subsampling. Here, we compare the three different subsampling strategies using Mandelbox shader. Uniform is the one we use in our main results. Opponent is always worse than uniform because it chooses from the worst features. And Oracle is always better than uniform because it chooses the best features. But both Oracle and Opponent require training an additional model with the full trace. Here's another example from Mandelbrot. Note there's a large performance gain by using extra program traces. For Trippy, we can pick a short trace length and uniform subsampling is often as good as the Oracle. Note, even when the sample budget is small, we can pick a short trace length corresponding to the left part of these plots and the extra information from the program trace can still substantially reduce the error without significant, a significant extra cost on inference time. Here are some discussions we feel might help future exploration in this direction. Firstly, besides training a model per shader, we could also explore whether part of the learning model can be shared across shaders within the same task. In our paper, we included a preliminary result by training a shared denoiser for four shaders. Ours can still outperform RGBX with 60% perceptual error on average. Our current framework also has some limitations, which leads to future work. For example, because the neural network's inference time is not negligible, the proposed framework may not be practical for simple and fast shaders as they could easily use the time budget to draw more samples. Future research might address this by developing specialized networks that are more efficient for inference. Additionally, the TensorFlow backend may become a bottleneck for some shaders, such as complex BRDFs or branching generated by varying number of root bounces per pixel. We believe further engineering efforts may alleviate these bottlenecks, such as adding a GLSL front end prior to the inference process. In conclusion, we present a compiler framework to augment neural network input with shader program traces. Our method consistently outperforms baselines such as RGBX, which uses manually picked auxiliary features as model input. Our analysis further shows that even subsampling a small subset of the trace can already improve performance against the baselines. With this, I will conclude my talk. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you. I have time for questions. Are there questions? Vishai. There seems to be none, so, so it's a bit up to me. So the first question I had was learning on multiple shaders. You already answered that, so that one is solved. Um, the, the other one that I had is, it's a bit of a philosophical thing. This is also why I like this work, like what, what's to be done in a program and what's to be done or what's to be learned. Um, it, my question is, is it possible to regress these intermediate shader states from the shader input? 
because if, if you think about what this is doing, there's some deterministic input and then there's some output and you're claiming that if you take these intermediate states and you give them as additional input, then something better can be computed. So the question then is, can you also have a neural network that regresses these intermediate states? Can you think about that? Does it make sense to you? So this is like another form of like program synthesis, but it's like instead of generating symbolic compute graph, like whether we can regress to the actual intermediate states computed yes, exactly. during program yes. execution. Yeah, yeah. Not sure that it's useful for anything, but as an intermediate hop to understand what's going on or why this all works, that would be interesting to me at least. Yeah, I think that's definitely possible, but it's like like the pro like the problem setup setup it might be tricky because currently the setup is like we have a like a program that's like probably a partial program we, we can have some partial computation from the simplified program and the trace from that and we learn from we learn the output or even the some of the trace from the more complicated program but if we want to learn the like the intermediate uh, states from a simply uh, even simplified program like what do we learn from if it's if it like yes, we can start from the like the bare input, like the UV coordinates and maybe a few parameters. But still, I, I think the problem needs to be like I think the regressor can work, but I it's it's probably we, there need to be some more specifications, like pro, probably the compute graphs or maybe the I don't know, the program. Um yeah, probably the compute graph can take some part, maybe the like the structure of the program should take some part in the learning. It's just like mathematically the regression should work, but I guess we probably need more context from the program for the learning to like be I actually thought, useful for something else. Yeah. Yeah, I thought so too. That that's not a complete solution to anything, but as some intermediate additional supervision, for example, asking a network to produce something as intermediate network state that has correlation, for example, to the shader states, there would be some hybrid mix of what you're doing and what classic learning would be doing. Yeah. Um, do we have questions by now? We have some audience. This I can tell you. I'm not sure if you see us or if you see me or if the stream is seeing somebody, but we're, we're happy we can talk to you. So then very quick, simple technical question uh, in the end. I didn't understand with this points. This apparently is vertex processing or point processing. So at least you operate on a domain where it's not obvious how to have convolutions. Uh, how do you do that? Because you said it's a CNN that takes the intermediate shader states. So what's the CNN on, on boids, on, on flocking and all of that? Yeah, for boys, it's actually not CNN. We directly use a, a fully connected network. So the state for boys is just like 2D tensors that encodes the position and velocity, velocity for each of the uh, for each of the boys. So it's like uh, just directly uh, uh, feed forward, feed, 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 feed forward, fully connected network should work. So that's actually also showcasing the idea of learning from program trace. It's like it's orthogonal to architectures. It can be applied to CNN. It can be applied to fully connected or GAN, like everything. Yeah, I, I see this, but as a baseline, there's also convolutions that you can have on unstructured domains, which are not fully connected something. So point net or all these derivatives of these things. Um, but it's just the detail of this baseline. I'm just trying to understand. But the main part is it, it also works in this setting. So really, really independent of, of what the underlying uh, CNN or fully connected network would be. Yeah. Cool. That answered my questions. I think the audience is happy. Let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. About the, oh yeah, here you are. Hello. Can you hear me? Hello. Hello. Okay. Good. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Sorry. Say something again, please. Do you hear me? Oh yes, I do. Uh, do you see us or do you see me? Hello. Maybe. Maybe not. Uh, I'm not seeing you, but I was seeing you from the YouTube. But on this. Uh -huh. on okay. This then I'm on YouTube. Okay. Proud of that. Um, so we can do, we have a bit of time of sound check. Can you get a bit closer to the mic? Because it, it, uh, it appears to me that sound quality varies a bit. So if you're, if you're close, it's good. But once you lean a bit back, then it seems to vary. So try to remember to stay close to the mic and then we'll, we'll hear you best. If you were to share your screen or they do that already. So we're good, um, except some flickering. So can we improve okay? on that? It's on your side. So what we see is like a roughly two hertz. Oh no, now it's gone. Okay.
Good. So then that's the second slash third paper of the session, real-time virtual try-on from a single example image through deep inverse graphics and learn differential renderers. Uh, long title, but I think the idea from reading yeah. it from me got quite okay. clear. Um, I'm not sure who's presenting today, but I'm very happy that you made it. Okay. So 30 minutes for you for the second slash third paper. Okay, so do you hear me very well now? So, so the question was, me? if we understand you, I didn't fully understand it. I'm sorry. <laughs> what did you ask? I think we hear you, but it wasn't quite clear. So just go ahead. I think it's, it's ready. Okay. So my name is Sileiba, and I am the third hot author. Okay, just to give you some context. So this work is done in the context of the digitalization of makeup at L'Oreal. And one of the popular applications that we have is virtual try-on. So virtual try-on is the ability to try a cosmetic, like it can be lipstick, it can be eyeshadow or hair coloration, uh, but using computer graphics. And classically, what we are doing is we are using classical computer graphics with a renderer that just render uh, the, the, the cosmetic that you want. And the requirement that we have is that our render has to be able to synthesize complex makeup material so often the, the renderer needs a very tedious manual parameterization, and it has to be able to run in real time on mobile devices because people have to try it online. So a classical pipeline for uh, augmented reality makeup is the following. So for example, this, this example is for makeup. So we have uh, lipstick parameters and we have an input frame. So we have the person who want to try the the lipstick, and we have a mesh estimator that will estimate the mesh of the face and extract from the face mesh the lips. And we also have a system that estimates the illuminant uh, of, the, of the scene. And then well, the lipstick parameters are sent to the renderer together with the illuminant of the scene, and the, and the new the lips with the correct with the correct lipstick are rendered and the lips are blended back, blended back to the original image. So this is the pipeline for lipstick, but we, and the parameters of the lipstick that you have there could be the makeup opacity, it could be the makeup color, so the RGB, it could be the amount of gloss of the makeup, and it could be also the, the, the gloss roughness and some reflection intensity. This is the type of parameters that we have for uh, lipstick makeup, par lipstick parameters. We have similar pipeline for, for hair coloration. And for hair coloration, the pipeline is the following. So we have an input frame and we have the system that will estimate, that will segment the hair. And also we, we, we also on, a, on a, another side, we have the hair parameters that you have to the left. And so the, the segmented hair color are let's say, uh, rendered on a reference hair swatch. And the, hair, the, hair, the reference hair swatch are re recolored to the, uh, targeted, to, the, to the target hair parameters. And then uh, the recolor hair swatch are blended back with the segmented hair to give the rendered hair. And then at the, at the end, uh, the, the rendered hair are blended back to the original, to the original person. So, it, so that this, in this way, the person can try a new hair coloration. So you can see emerging here a global trend of all these systems. So what our system need is that we need a source image and we need a cosmetic parameter GI. And the cosmetic parameter and the lips and the, the reference, the source image are sent to a renderer denoted here R and to generate, for example, here's a lipstick, but a similar pipeline will generate, for example, eyeshadow or a similar pipeline will generate also hair coloration. So now in this context, uh, the contribution of this paper are the following. So we, we, we propose a self-supervised framework for learning an inverse graphic encoder uh, for non-differentiable rendering engine. And also we applied this framework to the task of uh, example-based virtual try-on and we reached state of the art in real time on mobile devices for face makeup and hair coloration. 
So to the right, you can see reference images and the reference, uh, our system is extracting the parameters from the reference images, applying to the source image and to, to generate the to, to generate the third column, which is the, the rendered image with the right maker. So our method is based on a deep uh, inverse graphic encoder. So here we have a reference image and we build an, inver an encoder E that we call the, inver the inverse graphic encoder. And the inverse graphic encoder will predict uh, the rendering engine parameters. So here it is a, the, the cosmetic parameters. For example, in this case, it is a lipstick. So, and these parameters can be used then uh, feed to the renderer and the renderer will generate uh, the, 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 the source image at the, with the right uh, lipstick. So here you, you, ha you have the pipeline. So uh, the inverse graphic encoder, the inverse graphic encoder generates the, let's say the graphic code that is used by the renderer and the renderer can generate the, like the source image with the correct uh, cosmetic. So uh, the, the, tra the training procedure is the following. Here we, we it, it, it is trained self-supervised because we have the renderer. So what we can do is we can generate uh, randomly uh, some graphic codes that we can feed to the renderer. So we have a source image uh, without, uh, without lipstick and with the renderer to generate uh, like the, uh, the source image with the right lipstick. So the lipstick corresponding to the generated parameters at, at the beginning, that's just the sample parameters. And then we have our encoder and our encoder can like predict what should be the, the, the original uh, graphic code that has generated the lipstick. And in, in, for training, because we have sampled the, the graphic code, so we can match what has predicted the encoder to what to the original graphic code. Okay. And so the, the first training pipeline that we have is that we just compare like the two graphic codes using the L2 norm. So here you, you, GI is a graphic code, XI is a random portrait uh, image, so it's the source, source image. R is a renderer and E is our inverse graphic encoder. And we have this loss that we are minimizing okay, for training. Uh, but the one, one drawback of this way of training the system is that uh, we are computing the loss in the graphic code uh, space. And in the graphic code space, it's not uh, sure that what's happening in the image space is, is taken care of adequately. This is why we improve our, our framework by, by, by adding an imitator. And the role of the imitator is to, to generate a, a source image with lipstick as would have done our render, okay? So here, in fact, the, the imitator I is just emulating the render R. And the imitator is a neural network. So it's a, it's a, it's a unit, uh, no, it, it's a CNN. And uh, it, it's, a, it's a unit that will generate the, 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 let's say the source image with the, with the lipstick. So here it means that during training, uh, we, we, we can uh, at the same time uh, control the graphic code optimization. And we can also control the, 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 the appearance in the image space because our, our imitator is generating the image as would have done our render. And here to, to, to train our system, we, to train our imitator, we are using a perceptual loss. So uh, it, it's based on VGG. So we are using the internal layer of VGG to compare uh, the, 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 the original render uh, output to the imitator output. Okay. So our loss has two terms. We have the first based on the graphic loss and the other one based on the rendered image. So uh, to, to improve our, our imitator, we, we, we added uh, what we call a sensitivity loss. So to make sure that like the variation of the parameters are all taken into account. So what we have is uh, we have a first uh, term in the, in, the, in the imitator loss that compares the output of the imitator to the output of the render, original render. So we, this is the left side of the image. And to the right side of the image, what you have is a, a second loss that is based on adding variation of the component of the graphic loss and comparing the variation of the, the, the classical original render, which is not differentiable, 
to the variation of the of the imitator. So this allows us to make sure that like the variation of the component of the graphic code are, are as are taken care uh, in the similar way in the in the in the original renderer and in the imitator render. So here you can have some first result of our imitator. So if you if you take a look at the image that you have on the right, so the first column is the source images. Uh, the second column is a result generated by our imitator without the sensitivity loss. And the second, the third column are the result generated by the imitator with the sensitivity loss. And the, the fourth column are the ground truth. So what you can see here is that uh, uh, when, we, when we are using uh, the imitator without sensitivity loss, you can see that color is taken care adequately. So color is well represented by imitator, but the illumination and the gloss are not that well taken into account. And imitator and gloss are well taken into account when we added the sensitivity loss. Because the sensitivity loss is forcing our network to take into account small variation in the graphic code that we, it would not have taken into account. So, and here you have some results generated by our full pipeline. So you have the result for lipstick, which is the left, the first row. You have a result for eyeshadow, so the left, second row. And you have result for, for hair coloration. It is the two row on the, on the right. So what, what you see, can see here is that for hair color, for lipstick and for eyeshadow, so the, you, the, the makeup uh, transfer is, is done very well. So, so you, you can see that, that the lipstick is well represented on the source image from the reference to the source image and uh, the eyeshadow is also well transferred from the reference image to the source image. And here I, I have to mention that our, our pipeline is using the in our production pipeline, we are using the like the original render, which is based on computer graphic and not the neural network, because the neural network takes more time to for inference. The, and you can see also here that it is working well for hair coloration. So you can see that the although the red color, the color are a bit pinkish, where in the original it's a bit reddish. But you can see also in a, like in a, in the second example with the mix of the blonde and the black hair. Which is well transfer on the on the target, so on the source image. So and you can see also here a result of a lipstick makeup transfer. So many different lipstick on many different subjects. So here you have a pink lipstick, you have a red lipstick, and you have a purple lipstick, and you have various subjects. And you can see that uh, the lipstick are well transferred on this all the subjects. So here uh, we, we have some example uh, video where what we've done is that we have a reference image. We, uh, we extract the, the, the graphic code for the lipstick and we apply it to the video, but image per, per image. So here there is no temporal tracking. So we, just, we are just applying to the image. You can see that the, our, our, our pipeline is running very well and there is no artifact resulting from the changing of the orientation of the head or even speaking. So the lipstick is well transferred from the reference image to source image. Okay. Okay, so you have the result for various person and various lipstick. And you have similar result for, for hair coloration. And you see that the, for hair coloration, it is working. Uh, the transfer is working. It's less good, let's say, because here you have the reference image where you have the hair that is dark, dark black, and the hair are kind of less dark in the in, in, in the transfer. And you can see also that you have some glowing on the transfer due to the segmentation of the hair. This is not the neural network, but this, some artifact due, due to the hair segment. What you see here, here is that we have interesting pipeline for hair, hair transfer, hair coloration transfer.
So we did some comparison of our method with state of the art. So we compare as we computed, uh, we take a state of the art to uh, pipeline, the one that are classical, so the beach again, so and the control aware uh, again, which are doing makeup transfer, but in using neural network, no, not classically uh, computer graphic render. So here and the metrics that we are using is the L1 loss uh, structure similarity index and the, so, so, and some and the LIPS uh, metrics. So that are classical metrics to use uh, to compare, uh, uh, let's say, make a transfer. And this, this metric are used because they are kind of uh, somehow related to human perception. And you can see that on all this benchmark, uh, the, our pipeline is working better than the, the compare method. Also, we we had here some we have here some comparison between our method and 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 state of the art, and you can see that our method is taking care better the let's say the, the gloss for example than the the other uh, classical method. So gloss is well transport transferred and probably due to the use of the sensitivity loss we are making sure that all the tiny variations are well transferred from the image to the from the reference to the source and you see the same pattern for for for, for a shadow as well okay so here also but for for the hair coloration you see that the for example the michigan is is transferring better the hair coloration than our method because for example you can see that the Let's say the dark hair are well represented. Our dark hair are softer than the original one. And for the, let's say, for the purple hair, our, our method is somehow missing the, let's say, the gloss of, of, the, of the hair the, and the shininess. While our method, the, like the gloss on the head is, is, is less, less rep well represented. Okay. And we also do need some some uh, benchmark of the competition time to see if the uh, the, the method that we propose can re run on real time. And we tested it. Uh, we did some profiling on iPhones on a Safari web browser, and we can see that here that uh, let's say the inverse graphic uh, encoder is taking on an average about 27 milliseconds, and the landmark detection about 28 milliseconds. And the rounding and display is taking about 52, 50, 52 milliseconds, Me meaning that our, our pipeline it can be running on real time. And you can see on the pipeline how, it, how we are running it. So wh what we did is that we have a reference image, we extracted the graphic code, and we, we, we get extracted once, and we run the, the renderer on the on source videos. And then we completed this matrix. So to conclude my talk, I have presented you some some systems that we are developing at L'Oreal for computer for virtual trial using uh, computer graphic and neural network. So and it is well, our, our pipeline is based on uh, on an encoder that is able to from a reference image ex extract some graphic computer uh, graphic parameters that can be used for a render to generate the the relevant makeup. So the, the limitation that you can see about our, our work is that we are not using any 3D information, so which could be relevant also, because the face is a 3D object. Probably using 3D information can be a good idea, and also we are not taking into account some inter interaction between uh, the person that is doing the try on and the material and the reflectance. So and in the future we are work, we are planning to work on this to to. To problem to limitations. So this concludes my talk. So if you have questions, I will be happy to answer. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, hey, there's a question, Valentin. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure I completely catched why the necessity for the imitator network. You seem to have a forward model for the rendering. What was the benefit of training a unit to reproduce this um, rendering step? 
uh, because we, uh, when we want to compute the, we, 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 when we wanted to compute the, let's say the, the loss in the image space. So we wanted to be able to see what, because in fact, when we are doing the, when we are computing the loss only in the graphic parameter space, right, the gloss was not well represented. And that's why we need to be able to compare the image, uh, the reference image to the image that is generated after the micro -represent. Let me let me come back to this image. It doesn't look, doesn't, uh, it doesn't look convinced. No. Valenta <laughs> makes a non-convinced face. <laughs> Thanks, obviously. Yes. Okay. Uh, so no, here, uh, here we, we, we have we, we have the pipeline here that you, that you have on the on the screen. So we have uh, we have uh, let's say uh, um, our encoder that predicts the makeup uh, parameters uh, from a, from an image, and then in the the, the first loss we will will compare. Here you have to keep in mind that the render R, R is not differentiable, so we cannot differentiate. It's not differentiable <laughs> render. So we cannot that, compute. Exactly. So, okay. Valentin looks so very convinced we, now. We, 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 can, we can stop. He makes a very convinced face. And you, you can no, no, it, you it, so it's non differentiable. That is uh, the. Yeah, yeah, exactly. This is why we needed to add a imitator that is differentiable. So we can we can compute the derivative of the imitator. Good. Got it. Thanks. As said, he's convinced. Uh, there's one further question. It's from Gurpreet, and the mic is being taken there. Thank you. Uh, I, I enjoy the work quite a lot. Uh, I didn't understand. So you extract a mesh from an image. That's what you said, right? And then you perform ray tracing on that in this R block. Uh, we, uh, uh, Is that what happened in the, yeah, on this slide? Is this one? In fact, the, the, you, 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 you can consider the, this render as a black box. Okay. You are given a renderer that can generate this uh, image with makeup for you, and you don't know what's happening inside. Okay, I we, we in fact we because we have designed the say the original one, we know it's you know working. For example, here for the case of the lipstick, lipstick what we have is that we have uh, let's say uh, a three D face model that is fitted on the face, and from that we can estimate the lips. I see the shape of the lips. So here the rendering is working on 3D. See, and and when it's moving, like for example for the videos, you you do it per frame or how does that with the, with how the does that face translate to videos, for example? So when when the face is moving, we are doing face tracking, and we have a we have a system that tracks the face on 3D, and because we are just interested on the lips, so we have a lips at very high resolution and. The face is at lower resolution, and given that we have the the the, the lips, our renderer can use the lip shape and using classical computer graphic ray tracing to like to 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 to, to render the, the the lips at the with the right uh, makeup. But in fact, we we consider the let's say the 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 render R. As a black box, we consider you don't know what's happening inside. You just have a, you, you are just given a render that you can give it a, a, a graphic code and it will generate the, the image for you. And what you want is to be able to train a system that will generate. A, you, you don't want to have an expert that will do manual parameter manual parameterization of the system. So you just want to have a, a system that can learn by itself and extract the lipstick and apply to another person. Okay. One, one more question there. Yeah, please. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for the talk. Uh, I was just curious to know, even if you said that the renderer is kind of viewed as a black box, if it's uh, considered as a parameter of the original color, skin color or hair color of the person, because I guess uh, if you're talking about like high shadow, it's kind of semi-transparent or even like semi-transparent lipstick. It would depend a lot on the original skin color. Yeah, exactly. In, in fact, this is a, is a good question. And this is a very good question. It, it's at the end, it's what I'm saying. It probably I didn't say it very clearly. Is that, okay, this is a problem of all the, let's say, it's a problem of all the virtual trial system right now. Is that they are not taking into account the person that they are transferring the lipstick on. The, the trial on. So, in fact, the one that is on the center is uh, is the, the, the reference image. We extract the lipstick from the reference image, 
and then we apply it to another person. So we are not taking into account the difference between, okay, the original person and the, the target person. And also there's some complex interaction that, that are happening between, okay, the skin color of the original person, the skin color of the second person, the lighting, and even the property of the lipstick. Probably the lipstick is semi-transparent semi or opaque. And for now, we are not taking this into account. We are just giving to the system as much data as we can. And we are, think, we are expecting that the system will learn to transfer the lipstick from one person to another one. But we have seen that there are some limitations that we are going to work in the future. OK, thank you. There's one more question, but I will ask Valentin instead. I'll, I'll have a take, and then maybe there's time for yours still. Um, so what you're doing is, in the end, you learn this imitator to then produce you an image, which you then compare to a reference. Can you confirm? Sorry, yeah. again? So you, you learn this imitator to make an image, but the only purpose of this image in the end of the imitator is to be used in a loss to be compared to something else because this exactly, thing was yes. differentiable. So yes, you're not yes. actually doing anything with this image except comparing no, it to no. something else. That's, in fact, the imitator is, is so like you are learning. Couldn't you learn the function. metric directly? This would be the more standard way that you that you take the rendering parameters and you learn something really to, like just a matrix that would map these points in this rendering parameter space to another space in which points have distances which are proportional to perceived distances. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. It's a, it's a good remark. In fact, the imitator is just a loss that we are learning. In fact, it could be learned in another way. We can do we could do metric learning. So. We find it was interesting to have an imitator to because it, it has its value for itself because we can use it in place of the classical render. But okay, it's a, it's just a, a metric. An imitator is just if you, if you look at uh, I don't know if I get it here. So here you can think that the imitator is just a parameter of our loss actually. Okay. Yeah, you're only interested in the end result, not in the parameters. Exactly, yes. That's cool. Okay, Valentin will be very quick with the last question of the session. Yes, uh, I was just wondering if you did anything to match the maybe color um, warmth, say, or white point between the input image where you estimate the parameters and the target on which you're putting it so that, for example, the color of your makeup doesn't pop too much compared to the rest of the tone of the image or... I don't know if that's something you wondered about. And in fact, we are not doing anything special. We are just uh, localizing the mouse and we are extracting the mouse region that is large enough uh, so that you know the system will see either the skin around the mouse and the mouse itself. And this is what we are giving to as input to, our, to, to the pipeline. But we are not doing anything specific uh, to, to process to have better results. That's again a satisfied face from Valentin and everybody else is also happy and I'm also very excited that you could make it for the talk and would like to thank everybody. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to thank the audio people. It was really yeah, very difficult and getting it sorted and so on. So let's thank all the speakers again and I hope you enjoy the rest. Thank you. Thank you.